Welcome to the Up Arrow Podcast with William Harris, featuring top business leaders sharing strategies and resources to get to the next level. Now, let's get started with the show. Hey everybody, it's William Harris here. I'm the founder and CEO of Element and the host of this podcast where I feature experts in the D2C industry sharing strategies on how to scale your business and achieve your goals. I'm really excited about the guest that I have here, uh, Brian Nolan. Brian is a successful serial tech entrepreneur. He's a veteran of the e-commerce industry and his first company, Cellbrite, was acquired by GoDaddy in 2019. Now, Brian is co-founder and CEO of Book Outdoors, the fastest growing destination for finding and booking outdoor travel accommodations, such as campgrounds, RV parks, glamping resorts, and more. And the reason why this is a special guest to me is because Brian and I go way back. I started working at Cellbrite back when you guys were still at Idea Lab there out uh, in, in California and uh, founded by Bill Gross, right? For those of you who know Idea Lab. Uh, and so I've, I've known you and I've, I've worked with you personally uh, and, and consider you somebody that's a friend and a mentor. Uh, so I'm really excited to have you here, Brian. Awesome. Uh, I feel the same about you, man. And I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks. Um, before we jump in, we've got a lot of things that I want to talk through here, which is just even, you know, multi-channel, but then going into what you're doing at Book Outdoors and, and how that translates from B2B to B2C. Before we do, I want to call out the sponsorship. This episode is brought to you by Element. Element is an award-winning advertising agency optimizing e-commerce campaigns around profit. In fact, we've helped 13 of our customers get acquired with the largest one selling for nearly $800 million, And we were ranked as the fast 12th, 12th fastest growing agency in the world by Adweek. You can learn more on our website at Element, which is E-L-U-M-Y-N-T.com. That's enough of the boring stuff. On to the good stuff. Brian, tell me the backstory of how did you end up at Book Outdoors? So we talked about the acquisition at Celebrate, but okay, moving forward from there, what, what happened? What was it like at GoDaddy and what led you into bookoutdoors.com? Sure. So um, I ended up spending two years at GoDaddy as uh, a product lead for their emerging e-commerce and payments division. Um, and that was fun and all, but it's not a, not a startup, right? So I wanted to sure. get back into the startup world where that's my sweet spot. I thrive. I love the zero to one journey. Yeah. Um, and so after two years, I left GoDaddy and just so happened to connect with, I actually planned to take some time off and kind of think about what I wanted to do next. How could I use my e decades of e-commerce experience to do something new but not the same old thing. I wanted a new challenge. I didn't want to just repeat and do the same thing I've been doing for the last 10 years. So um, as luck would have it, as the, as the stars aligned, uh, Roy Rubin, who is the founder of Magento, the world's biggest e-commerce sure. platform. Uh, I happened to get to know him a little bit, just being in the e-commerce space. We had mutual friends. Um, and he reached out and said, hey, what are you doing next? Uh, I want to talk to you about this idea. And so he had connected with Amir Harpaz, who's, who's now our co-founder in this business. Amir is a owner of RV parks and campgrounds, RV resorts, really, in the southeast of the U.S. He's, he's a leader in the outdoor hospitality space, uh, really well-known in the industry and a big advocate for outdoor hospitality. And um, he had been tinkering with the idea of a travel marketplace you know, think Expedia or booking.com, but sure. specifically for outdoor hospitality. He, as a campground owner, wanted that distribution channel to be able to sell his inventory, to get more visibility for his campgrounds. So Roy had connected with Amir. He loved the idea of being an RVer himself, who's Roy's now an investor uh, with a, with a, he's got a VC firm called R squared. Um, okay. And so he connected with me. They both realized they needed a tech co-founder CEO um, type to run this thing. And so we started chatting and I realized, you know what? I, first of all, I love the outdoors. I grew up in Southern California, now live in Colorado. Uh, I love getting outdoors. Um, but I felt like this was that perfect sweet spot of it's a, you know, we're, we'd be building a B2C marketplace. And so yeah. I could take all my learnings working with the biggest marketplaces in the world for a decade, like Amazon and eBay and Etsy and those guys. And um, everything I knew about e-commerce and apply it to this business, but it's, but it's still something new and different for me. So it's a different vertical. Yeah. It's travel. It's a B2C. So we can build this consumer-facing brand that I thought would be really fun to do, which is really fun to do. Um, and so it was kind of exactly what I was looking for. So I said, okay, cool. give me a month off. <laughs> Let me take yeah. some decompression time here. 
and then we'll dive into it. And so that's what happened. That's how we started. I love that. And and I think one of the things that I love about that is is just the idea of, you know, as as an entrepreneur, as a CEO, you're uh you're the type of person who has to sometimes move in order to feel good about just life and yourself and whatever. And so, you know, jumping right into something makes a lot of sense, especially something that you enjoy like the outdoors, right? Yeah, exactly. And it, you know, honestly through through that month I was like chomping at the bit and I was doing my research and learning. It was a new industry for yeah. me. Travel, you know, working sure. in the travel space and the outdoor hospitality space is new. So I like that as an entrepreneur. I like entrepreneurs that come into a space that bring experience that can be applied, but are a little bit naive to the space because then you're not constrained sure. mentally in a box, right? You can think outside the box yep. and do things differently maybe than people are used to. And that's how disruption happens. So exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah taking something from one area, bringing it to another area that nobody else was thinking of because sometimes they have tunnel vision and what they, well, this is just what we do. And you can break them out of that mold. Right. And at the same time, I wanted to be sensitive and aware that I don't want to kick the door in and be like, this is how we're all going to do it now in this industry. Right. right? <laughs> right. So right. having a mirror as a co-founder who is very knowledgeable about this industry, who does have the relationship seemingly yeah. with everybody helps a lot, helps validate what we're doing. We, and, and again, I came in listening and learning and seeing where we can apply things from the e-commerce, even the traditional hospitality space to this yeah. space without completely making too many waves and, you know, and, and pissing people off. Yeah, yeah. for sure. But I, I want to dig into that. Like, what are some of the differences that you've noticed in running, let's just say B2C as opposed to B2B and like the different like market strategies that you've had to employ or just what are the differences that you've noticed or similarities as well? Very different from a marketing perspective, right? Um, Cellbrite was a B2B SaaS business. So we're targeting and we're marketing to other businesses, small to mid-sized e-commerce businesses. Um, you talk to them differently. Uh, sure. you know, the trade shows are different, all those things. This is now in a space where you, there is some competition for eyeballs, maybe not, uh, there's a little bit of direct competition, but there's other kind of adjacent competition too. Um, sure. so you're competing for eyeballs for somebody's attention on what, how they're going to plan their next trip. What are they going to do? You're even competing with hotels and, yeah. you know, and all the big guys. So, um, it, it's very different. Um, definitely, you know, brand and uh, social media and experience and lifestyle are way more important in a consumer facing one than, than on a B2B. Well, it's still, you know, a little important, but um, you're, you're trying to tap into the emotions of the consumer and yeah. get them to not only think about outdoor hospitality for their next trip, but booking with us and why we're better and why we can, create a better experience from the beginning, from the planning and booking stages of your trip, which is also the exciting piece, right? Yeah, um, yeah. So it's just a different angle and different employees and, you know, different talent that you need to hire um, to attract that kind of user in, in different KPIs that you're measuring. Yeah. You know, and what are some of the different KPIs? Are there, are there certain things that you've been f surprised by? You're like, wow, that was such an important KPI for us in the SaaS world. And we're not using that at all here. Um, and maybe ones that you're like, boy, that's a KPI. We didn't track at all in SaaS, but this is wildly important for us here. Well, I think the big thing is the business model is different. So in SaaS, sure. it's recurring revenue, right? And which is yeah. a beautiful thing. <laughs> and yeah. Revenue just stacks up month over month and you're really focused and concentrated on, um, churn, what your churn rates are. Um, and, um, that's kind of, you know monthly recurring revenue MRR or or ARR annual recurring revenue yep. and churn those are kind of the big numbers that you're focused on. Where in this space, yes, you want repeat customers as well, obviously, but you're looking at ROAS, return on ad spend, and um, you know conversion rates and things like yeah. that much more closely. Yeah. Um, I, I want to shift into Cellbrite stuff a little bit because we had talked about this before, multi-channel being. You know, when when you're talking to a lot of brands, they're looking at how do I go omni-channel, how do I go multi-channel, but how do I make sure that I do that in a way that makes sense to my brand? And it might not always make sense 
uh, for every brand or the way that you do it doesn't make sense for every brand. And you had a lot of experience in this both before starting Cellbrite and through Cellbrite. What are some of your thoughts there on the different ways that people are approaching multi-channel? So it's very interesting. This is one area that definitely carries over from my experience at Cellbrite to Book Outdoors, um, because a lot of it is education of the of the sure. of the customer of your user. Right? Why do you want to adopt a multi-channel strategy? And it's very similar for e-commerce and travel. And it's really about the idea of getting in front of a wide, as wide of an audience as possible. Think about yourself and where you shop online. Not everybody shops at the same places online, especially sure. if you're buying different kinds of products. And so it's not just, you know, just you can have your own website to take bookings or to take, sit, you know, orders directly. And we recommend that. Um, but not everybody's going to do a Google search and go find your website and shop there. People have habits of yeah. shopping on Amazon. I do a lot of my shopping on Amazon and uh, or I go to eBay first you know, hard to find things or whatever. So yeah. the audiences are different and you need to get in front of as many people as possible. Now, what you list is different, right? That you can have different strategies there. So back at Cellbrite, what we learned is um, sometimes brands will just list everything everywhere, which is great. They have more of a commodity product. They just want to sure. get as many sales and eyeballs as possible. And most marketplaces, including Book Outdoors, we charge the seller a commission for the sale. And the, what we always talked about was think of that as a essentially risk-free marketing expense. You don't pay that unless you actually get a sale. Very different sure. than running Google ads. You have to pay for the clicks even if you don't get a sale. So yeah. um, you're, you're, it's access to a huge audience, hundreds of millions or billions of users in certain cases, right? for um for a small commission to the sale um mm -hmm. so some people some brands make sense to list everything in particular like fashion brands oftentimes it makes sense to use the marketplaces as liquidation channels so they have this season's all the current product sure. on their own website yeah. they do drops there and then they have leftover excess inventory from last season or whatever and they can put that on ebay or amazon or whatever um same thing in the travel space. We talk about, you know, sometimes these campgrounds are super popular on the weekends and, and uh, holidays. They don't need help there, but they do need help on the weekdays or off seasons. Sure. Um, so same kind of strategy. Um, and then finally, in certain cases, it doesn't, sometimes a, a multi-channel strategy doesn't make sense. And where it doesn't make sense, we've seen the most is if you have some kind of unique experience that you've created on your own website that can only be done there. So um, think like if you're, you know, selling eyeglasses and you have a certain experience on your site sure. that's using the camera so you can see the glasses on your face and try things yeah, on. Sure. You built like this technology. Parker. Yeah. Yeah. And you've yep. built this technology to, yep. um, to, you know, create that kind of experience. Well, you can't just go list it on eBay and have that same experience necessarily. Right. right? So in those cases, maybe it doesn't make sense. Or, you you know, again, it's maybe for excess inventory. But I think broadly, having a multi-channel strategy does make sense for most e-commerce retailers. Um, and that was always our position at Cellbrite. And what led us to start Cellbrite, because we were doing that at an online retailer before Cellbrite. Yeah, well, like you said, it's, a lot of this comes down to just following your customer. Where is your customer at? And if your customer is already over on Amazon, for instance... Um, the last time I remember checking those stats, Amazon takes about 76% of the product searches now. So 76% of all product searches start on Amazon. That's a nice. massive amount. If you're not there, you know, you're saying, hey, I just want people to come to my website. You're missing out on an insane amount of people that might be looking for something very similar to you. Uh, and you're just not even showing up. You're just not even in the game at all with them. Um, and it's so like the same saying thing you don't like, want your website listed on Google, right. like you don't want to show up on Google, <laughs> right, right? Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm not, I don't want to have, it's like, even when we say like, I don't even want a website. If they want me, they come to my store. It's okay. You know, well, maybe there's a way that you can be where your customers are. Um, and, and I liked how you called out the idea of, um, excess inventory, because that is something that happens a lot, especially like you said, in fashion where it's, it's this season and next season, this isn't going to be okay anymore. It's not going to be good. And so, they can't sell at full price. They need to move that inventory. And that's a big cash flow issue for a lot of businesses. Um, and being able to offload that inventory, even if it's at a discount, is great. 
And I, I think what I've seen a lot of businesses do in those situations then would be to uh, sometimes list it under like a, a different name, like a, like an outlet name, right? And so it'd be, yeah. you know, fashion outlet or something. So that way they, they can still maintain full prices on their website for all of the current stuff, but then just moving this uh, off-season stuff there without uh, diluting their brand equity too. Yeah, that, that brand equity and integrity is super important for especially the higher end you, you get with a brand. Um, yeah. Yeah, we say, I mean, that's, if you remember the flash sales sites like uh, Gilt Group and Hot Look, like that was part of the appeal there yeah. was that they were behind a login and paywall. And so you, you not everybody could just see that their brand was there. You had to be a member, you had to log in. Um, right. So same kind of thing here. Yeah. Um, one of the other things that I wanted to talk to you about too was uh, leading with empathy. Uh, this is something that I witnessed firsthand with you. You were very good about being able to lead the Cellbrite team. Um, for those who don't know, I was remote. I was in Minnesota. You guys were in California. And I still felt like I was part of the team uh, as much as anybody else would have. Um, how? What are some tips or tricks that you have for people who are leading any team, whether it's remote or not, but just leading with empathy and being able to get your team uh, aligned on these visions and where you're going. Man, I mean, uh, first of all, thank you for saying that. We, It's not easy to have most employees in a single physical location and have some remote and still make them feel included. So I'm glad you felt that way. Um, uh, you, know, I, I, you know, empathy, I think, is like the most important <laughs> characteristic of a leader. You need to listen. You need to put yourself in other people's shoes, whether that's your customer, your partners, your employees. Everybody's different. Yeah. Everybody has things going on. I'm not perfect either. Obviously, I had, you know, times where I, I, sure. I faltered there, but um, I tried to do that. And we made that part of our like training material, even with our customer mm -hmm. support team at Cellbrite to talk to normally when customers are calling you, it's because something's wrong and they're upset. And so we put empathy training in our customer support training program so that they can understand, they can put themselves in the customer shoes. And you know what, after yeah. six, eight hours of just being sometimes yelled at as a customer service <laughs> rep from customers, it's hard to do that. It is. <laughs> you have to be like very aware but it's so important. And on the employee side, you know, again, it's just sitting and listening and trying to understand the point of view of the, of the employee and where they're coming from, um, building that trust early on. You try to hire people that you feel like you can build trust quickly. Sure. Um, uh, you know, so I, you know, I, in terms of like tips or tricks, I don't know if there are any really, I mean, studying what empathy is and understanding that piece of it, I think is helpful. I mean, we used, I still use mindfulness meditation as a way to be present, uh, as a yeah. exercise for my brain to be present on conversations and not be distracted. And maybe that's a big part of empathy too, is to be able to sit and listen and truly hear what the person is saying and digest sure. that. And so if you're distracted and you have things going off, that's hard to do. And you don't, you kind of, you, you feel distracted to the other person, right? Sure. Uh, so mindfulness meditation and, and, um, uh, you know, just there's cool apps now that have been around for a while, like Headspace right. and Calm and 10% and yeah. Happier that can help you learn how to do that. Um, but I think that's a, you know, a big important thing as a leader is to be empathetic. Yeah. Recognizing, like you said, that they're, a human being. Um, they're not just a cog in the wheel. Uh, there's a, a really good painting that I like by uh, Richard, and I might forget the last name. I think it's Sergeant Richard Sargent, um, called Anger Transference. Um, and it shows this uh, like four different quadrants where um, in the top quadrant, the boss is yelling at this guy. And then the next uh, one, it shows uh, this guy yelling at his wife because he's got holes in his socks. And then the next one shows his wife yelling at their son because maybe he made a mess or something. I don't remember. And then the next one shows the son yelling at the cat, right? And it's just that idea that it's very easy for anger to transfer from person to person. And I can imagine being on a phone call in customer support, you're getting yelled at all day. It's very hard to refine your, your calmness and your balance when that's when it has just been spewed all over you. Um, but having a leadership team 
that is pouring back into you, some of that empathy and compassion, even having yoga. I remember we had yoga session at, at yeah. Celebrate as well. And, you know, those things can help to just rebuild that back up and reminding, reminding them that, you know, those customers are also human beings who, who may just be transferring some of the anger that they're, they're having and the frustration they're having. Maybe their boss has yelled at them. And so they're yelling at you now and it's not make it right, but it's like, how do we, we ha- it has to end that cycle at some point in time. How do we flip that back around? And uh, there was uh, Ted Rubin uh, on the show a couple of weeks ago. And one of the things he talked about was the time that you have 100% of your customer's attention for the most part is during customer service. That is the time right. when they absolutely want to hear what you have to say. They are listening to every word and they're they are watching every word very closely that you say. Um, and, and how you handle those situations can be absolutely magical or absolutely detrimental to the business. 100%. And a cu- couple points I wanted to make there too. We've had several instances at Cellbrite where we were on like the review sites and so forth, um, where we turned a one-star review into a five-star review just because we talked to the customer and listened to them and yeah. had a human conversation and understood where they were coming from and apologized and explained where we were coming from and had that human connection. And they appreciated that and flipped the review from a one to a five, like multiple times over the course of our, you know, That's, business there. So um, the other thing I'll point I wanted to make too is we're all human. We all mess up. I've had, especially as an entrepreneur, when the stress is high, I've come into the, to the office and been a jerk with the team and not practiced empathy not shown empathy to the team. And in those situations, go, you know, I go home, sleep on it, maybe come back the next day or later that day and swallow your pride and sure. acknowledge that you messed up and that um, they don't, you know, they deserve to be treated better or whatever and like kind of talk through it with them. And that goes a long way and it builds that trust back up. And, you know, we I had to do that. It's not fortunately, not a lot of times, but I had to do that uh, a couple of times it maybe even builds the trust up more than if you hadn't lost, it. not saying that you should lose your cool as a boss, but, but uh, you know, I remember hearing even in marriage counseling, they'll say something along the lines is, you know, if you've been married for 10 years and, and you genuinely say to each other, Oh, we've never had a fight. It's like, you have to question whether you actually love each other then or not, because if you love each other, like there are going to be emotions and those emotions are going to disagree from time to time. And you're going to have disagreements and arguments and fights. And it's, it's a natural part of that. Um, otherwise maybe you're just too apathetic to even have, have that emotional disagreement in the first place. And so by, by having sometimes those moments where, where things don't go the way that you wanted them to, you have those even as a team, um, but then you can acknowledge that and you can apologize and you can get better. I think that that goes even further because we all wonder, well, but sure, it's easy to be kind when things are working out well, but what happens when something isn't going the right way? And if you do have that ability to come back to somebody and say, hey, I messed up, I think that that goes even further for gaining somebody's trust and appreciation. Right. 100% agree. Um, Something else I wanted to talk to you about then, too, was the acquisition. So uh, a lot of people who are listening um, either have been acquired or are looking to get acquired. uh, and, And it's an exciting thing. It's a scary thing. Uh, and so people who are are thinking about going through this or just going through this, um, I'd love to talk to them, uh, have you talk to them a little bit about your experience of what was it like? So you, you get through this, you know, how do you feel, you know, wh- where do you go from here? Yeah, so we were fortunate to be, you know, one of the few businesses that do get acquired. It's hard and most businesses don't get acquired. And we were also lucky to get acquired by, a great company in GoDaddy. Um, and they've been around for a long time, obviously. They've built um, a great culture. They've been working really hard to revamp their reputation from the early days over the last sure. decade or more. Um, and so I, I would say the first thing is as you're you know, in the process, I guess, of, of acquisition or you're um, courting suitors for acquisition, culture has got to be one of the biggest things. Like that was so important for sure. us. We had actually had the benefit of working with GoDaddy as a partner first. So we got to know the people and really like them. Like they're all people that I would have hired myself at Cellbrite, right? And that goes so far and makes such a huge difference. Um, And ultimately why we ended up um, going with them. Now, 
you know, like I said, in the beginning, GoDaddy was a great place and the culture was great and we were doing some fun stuff there, but it is, you're going, I went from a 20 something person startup to a multi thousand person corporation and things are different, right? So as a founder, as an entrepreneur, small uh, startup kind of entrepreneur, that transition is sometimes hard. GoDaddy did have a really good um, actually transition team. They call them transition team to Mm-hmm. to to integrate us as fast as possible and um so that helped a lot as well um but there's a couple things here so one is just getting into a bigger company and where you're no longer the boss and you're you are just uh you know we became director senior director level i think um and so we had people under us we had people over us um and you get to learn different things which is great and you learn from different people but it is very different spend a lot of time sure. planning for meetings and, you know, with the CEO and and so forth. Um, But I think the big thing is entrepreneurs often tie their identity to their business, right? You hear it talked about as their baby or as sometimes they're just known like one-to-one. You think of the business, you think of that person and they're tied very closely together. And so I think one of the biggest challenges for any entrepreneur or any founder that whose company gets acquired is di- that disconnection of your identity or giving your baby, handing your baby over to somebody who can now do whatever they want with it. And sure. sometimes they keep that brand going and they, you know, you keep driving the mission forward of what you wanted to do. And sometimes they have other plans and they want to just bring in the technical assets or the talent or whatever. And the brand's not as as important. They kind of let that go by the wayside. And that's really hard to deal with as a founder when you've poured your life and blood, sweat and tears into something for however many years to to turn it over. And you get this jubilation of awesome, we got acquired and might be life-changing from a financial perspective. But then to see what you know, the, the, the acquirer does with your business and your brand and your employees and your customers, um, is hard sometimes. Like they don't, they, you know, from my experience, they don't get treated the same as you treated them. And there's often, you know, our, our employees were, were fortunate. There was other opportunities for them to move within the company and do things they were interested in. Um, um, so that's, that's an important piece of it, but you know, sometimes the customers don't get the, just talked about like that empathy and that, you know, a customer gets to talk to the founder and like turn the star, right. you know, one star to five stars, all of a sudden that goes away. And, sure. you know, I don't have that kind of control anymore. And, um, and it's tough. And it, funny thing is that, you know, so we got acquired in 2019, uh, four years ago, I still occasionally get like LinkedIn messages or even text messages from customers that had my cell phone number back in the day asking sure. for help on something. And I'm like, I, I'm not even there anymore. I can't, I, you know, uh, there's nothing I could do. Um, mm. So, you know, I've seen some stats. I talked to somebody who um, was at Google for a while helping his whole job was to help the entrepreneurs of the companies that Google acquired um, assimilate into Google and find their purpose and, and still perform at that same level that they were performing at as a, as a founder. And I think he saw something like 43 companies acquired during his time and 42 of the founders were unhappy at some level mm. from unhappy down to like clinically depressed. Um, only one wow. was truly happy. And that one was never tied his identity to the business in the first place. So for him, it was a pure transaction and it was easy for him or her. I don't know if it was he or her. Um, So uh, it's hard and it's a true, it's, you know, I want to make sure I come across because this is not like a pity story. Like, Oh, what was me? I got my company acquired and now I'm sad. (laughs) It's very, it's a great thing to have your company acquired for the most part. But there is this piece that doesn't get talked about very much that yeah. is a you know is hard to kind of deal with for most founders, um, and uh, you know oftentimes they'll leave the company that acquired them before the the time that they commit. I committed two years um, after we got acquired. We saw some other companies be acquired by GoDaddy, and some of those founders left less than a year just because sure. it wasn't their thing. You know, it's, it, people deal with it differently and. Um, 
So yeah, it's just something to kind of be aware of. How do you deal with the stress of being an entrepreneur and acquisition? I mean, there, like you said, you talked a little bit about meditation and headspace, but you know, do you have routines or things that have helped you cope with even all the way through running the business and the ups and downs and the stress of that? I just shove it down. No, <laughs> I don't think that's true at all. <laughs> uh, well, I, you know, I don't have a... I don't have a routine that I do every day. I kind of pick different tools for my tool chest, depending on how I'm feeling or what I'm dealing with. Fortunate to have a uh, supportive spouse that I can vent to if I need to, and she'll listen and be empathetic to me. Huge. Yeah. Um, and I try not to burden her too much, but it is a roller coaster to be an entrepreneur, a roller coaster of emotions, right? You can have really great days and really bad days the next day, next day. Um, Obviously, I get outdoors. I think being outdoors yes. is uh, is a, a huge part of mental wellness. Um, we say this all the time at Book Outdoors that we feel like getting outdoors is the remedy or the balance to our connected modern lives. Just yeah. unplug. Just go for a walk. Take a trip if you can. Uh, use Book Outdoors to book it. But uh, you know, just, <laughs> yeah. just getting outdoors and taking a breath of fresh air, going for a five minute walk listening to the birds sing, seeing, just looking at nature. There's studies that have shown that, you know, it's, uh, it increases cognitive function and creativity and obviously reduces stress. So finding those things that work for you, um, you know, so for some people it's like playing video games and just being immersed in a different world for sure an hour or whatever, and like just kind of forgetting about it. Um, so I, you know, I, when it is hard, I try to clear my mind in one way or another meditation or whatever. Um, and, you know, just find things that can give me a little bit of space from the thing that's stressing me. And so I can yeah. get back to it. I want to come back to the book outdoors thing here. There's a thing I know oftentimes in the D to C space on Twitter, where we talk about touch grass, it's like this thing, it's like touch grass on the weekend. And, and to your point, there, there's studies, I think science is just now really starting to catch up to a lot of um, how much this matters to our human emotion and our, even our physical health of, let's just even say, you know, grounding and, and having your feet on the grass and having your feet touch that. And let's just even talk about like ions and everything like this is beyond me. Like I'm not the scientist that will even begin to claim to understand this, but even just seeing the color blue outside in the sky, seeing the colors of green, feeling the breeze move through you, all of the different, let's just even say like the pollens and the things that are out there, the sounds of bees, you don't even necessarily know it, but like all of these things, they're having an impact on us. And, and let's even say for thousands of years, humans have existed around these types of environments and they are calming to us. They, 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 We've almost adapted to that and, and to uh, remove ourselves too much from it. I think that there is a detriment to it. So I would say that I'm a huge fan in agreeing with you of get outdoors and, and just yeah. be a part of nature. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's even a part of meditation is feeling your feet on the earth and like the yeah. gravity pulling you down. And um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I want to talk a little bit about just like the personal side of who is Brian Nolan as well. Oh man! Um, and then, oh, I know there's some fun things and I know a lot more about you maybe than I do uh, all of our other guests, but um, you used to be an EMT uh, before way, way, way before, right? Like what was, what was that like being an EMT? Like what were the th fun things, bad things, any good stories there that you could tell? I know there's some that you probably can't tell, but some that you could tell. Yeah. Yeah, so I was a EMTP, which is a paramedic EMT, so okay. advanced level, advanced uh, level. So what happened? You know, I was in. I'm old. I was in the early web 10com <laughs> era, right? And yeah. when the dot com crash happened, I got laid off, like many others. Um, and then right after that, nine eleven happened, and I had grown up loving. Again, I'm going to date myself. Uh, shows like Emergency and Chips and like first responder kind of shows back in the day. And, uh, and then in high school, I was in, I grew up in Los Angeles. So I was in the LA city fire department, junior explorer program in high school or junior high, high school, I guess. Um, and so I'd always kind of been fascinated with that. And so once, I don't know, I was like, you know, early twenties, um, the, the tech industry was kind of in shambles at the moment. 
9-11 happened. I didn't have a wife or kids or anything then. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to do this. I'm going to go be, take an EMT course first. So like the basic one, yeah. which is only like three months um, and become an EMT. And so and maybe join the fire department and like go that route. Maybe that's my career calling. So I did that and um, joined a private ambulance company as an EMT first, the basic life support. Uh, and mostly what you do there is like transfers of patients from one hospital to another. Not the most glamorous thing in the world, but you got to pay your dues, do that. Sure. I think nine months is the minimum requirement to then enroll in paramedic school where you learn all the advanced life support, all the drugs, all the innovation, defibrillation, all that kind of stuff. So I, as soon as I could, applied to the best paramedic school in LA um, and went through paramedic school, which is like 45 units, I think, in a year, which is a ton. You do a full anatomy physiology course and plus all the paramedic stuff and um, and became a paramedic and then trained with LA City Fire Department, um, was testing to join fire departments around Southern California mostly, um, and working for another private ambulance company that had the contract to do all the 911 stuff for LA sure. County fire and Santa Monica fire and so forth. So was running 911 calls and, um, man, that is talk about dealing with stress, right? They talk about being in the fire department is many hours of boredom interrupted by chaotic stress. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so I, I happen to work at stations that were super busy. So we were like, go, go, go for 24 hours straight. Wow. Um, but it really taught me to fall back on your training and what you know, and don't let the environment and the stressful situation fluster you because you cannot yeah. operate as a paramedic if you do that, right? You have to get back to what you know and how to do it. Um, so it was, it was fun and I still miss doing that sometimes. Like it's different every single day. Obviously there's yeah. different things that come up. Um, and I've, and I volunteered for fire departments, even police departments since then, um, to just kind of get back into it a little bit and give back as well. Um, but that was, you know, really fun. But what I did learn was that I still really love technology and the internet and things were starting to come back. And I didn't particularly, particularly love the culture of the fire department, um, and what it was like to do 24 or 48 or 72 hour shifts and not be home. Oh. And that was tough. That was really tough. Yeah. So I, I did it for a total from the very beginning of EMT to the end of being a paramedic for about five years. Um, but transitioned out and started a different company after that. Uh, but it was still, like I said, I still miss it. It was fun. I saw some horrible, horrible things, some funny things, uh, made some great friends, you know, you, you, yeah. you trust, you have to trust and rely on your partners. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was, it was fun. Yeah, um, you and I have talked about this before because I was I was a registered nurse for anybody yeah. listening that didn't know that, and uh, so saw a lot of similar things in our fields uh, there. And one of the things that I take away one of my biggest uh, memories from that time of my life was, um, and I don't know if you can relate to this. I've I've held the hand of people as they take their last breath um, yep. on numerous occasions, and you feel life leave their body. And for me, it was, let's talk about grounding. It's, it's one of those moments where uh, it reminds me that there are more important things in life. And sometimes if I get uh, out of my clean headspace and, and, you know, get overwhelmed or stressed out or frustrated, reminding myself that it's like, you know, is this the most important thing that's going on in the world right now? Or is this something that is much more trivial? And I need to remind myself that it's like, I'm breathing. That in and of itself is a miracle. And so it's like, I'm breathing, just come back to earth. And, and, and appreciate where you are right now. And uh, yeah. Yep. I've done that. And I've also given people life back, which I'm sure you did too, oh, right? Yeah. Where that's also incredible to give them a second chance and to bring their, to see them dead on the ground and then alive again is incredible. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I try to remember that now too. Now I have a, a daughter, seven-year-old daughter and you know, when I'm stressed out about work and trying to get something done that I feel like needs to get done right now today and, and it's late, and my daughter wants to spend time with me, I stop and I, I try to stop and think about like, does this really need to get done right now? Can this, if I wait till tomorrow morning, yeah. what's the impact? And what's clearly more important is spending time right. with her. Um, so I tried to do that and try to like 
take stop and break and be present with her, realizing that the email or whatever it is, in certain cases, yes, it does need to yep. get out today, right? There's deadlines. Yep. But in many cases, it doesn't matter if it gets done today at 6, 7, 8 p.m. or tomorrow at 7, 8 a.m. Right. And just get it done. And you're probably thinking clear more clearly anyway in the morning. So yeah. um, I try to remember that as well. Something else about you that I really appreciate is uh, you are a magician um, and and a good oh, one. Man. I know you won't you won't admit as, as that you're good, but you have to be. So you were a part of, if I remember correctly, like it's like a secret society. It's I don't know if it's a secret society, but like Magic Castle <laughs> there, and not like the Disney one. Uh, there in L.A. and like you have to like pass a test and like do magic tricks well enough that they let you yeah. in. Um, and I and you took me with you one time. And they have this piano for you. If you guys have never been there, they have this piano that plays by itself. It's piano's name's Norma. It's a really I don't know. It's a really fun uh, ev event place to be at. But tell me about like magic and like what you got you into magic and and you know how that's been a part of your life. Again, growing up in the eighties, nineties, man, with David Copperfield was like <laughs> everything, right? Those yeah. those annual um, those annual TV specials he did, where he made Statue of Liberty disappear, or whatever. I loved that stuff, and I got into it as a kid. Whenever he would come through and tour in LA, I would like beg my mom to take me to the show, and so I got to see him a couple times in person. And um, so I'd been. I don't know. I'd just been kind of fat, infatuated with magic as a kid and got out of it as, as it became a little bit uncool, I think, through like sure. late high school years and in college. Uh, and just you're distracted and you have other things you're interested in. Um, but I have a friend, Alan, who I met randomly at a, we were both members of a totally different uh, architecture group. And he said, this is back in LA when I lived there. And he said, um, Hey, have you ever been to the Magic Castle? So for those of you who don't know the Magic Castle, if you live in LA, you know it, but Magic Castle is a private club for magicians in LA. It's the clubhouse of the Academy of Magical Arts. So you think about like the Academy of Motion Pictures or whatever. This is the Academy of Magical Arts. It's a private clubhouse for magicians and their guests. You have to audition to become a member. So Alan was a member and I'd been once before as a guest uh, and loved it. And he said, yeah, you should, uh, you know, you should come with me sometime as my guest. And so I, I, I went again as a right around 30 years old or so, and maybe a little older, 32, something like that. And, um, and I loved it. I kind of fell back in love with that, the mystique of, of close up magic. And that's yeah. my thing that I love now is like cards and coins and close up magic. Um, and so I started going with him more as a friend and a guest. And then I made it a bucket list item to become a member. I'd always wanted to be a member as a kid. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to get back into this. I still get to know the fundamentals. I just need to practice. And so I took like um, probably a couple of years, year and a half, something like that, to really like get back into it, go with him frequently, work on my routine that I was going to do for an audition. And by the way, I'm not a professional magician. I've never been paid to do a show. It's just a hobby. I like doing for friends, bar magic mostly. You yeah. Know? Um, and so, and now my daughter's into it too, which is cool. But, is um, fun. so I just like practice, practice, practiced, um, went to the magic castle as much as I could as his guest and did stuff for people, you know, and just kind of like got out there and then auditioned one day. I, I made it set at a goal to, I want to be a member by the time I was 35. So the, I think it was the day after I turned 35, they do the auditions on Mondays, first Monday of the month. So just kind of happened to line up that way. But I did the audition pass on my first try. Nice. And I've been a member since. So it's been over a decade now that I've been a member of the Magic Castle. Um, super fun to go. Hard to get into if you you kind of have to know a member to get a guest pass to get in or to go with a member. So I like to bring people like you when they're come from out of town and uh, are nerdy like me yeah. <laughs> and know you would love it too. Uh, but it's just fun. It's, that, that's another escape, right? Like yeah. just to have, and Magic Castle is a hundred plus year old Victorian mansion that these brothers, the Larson brothers, uh, who Milt Larson just passed away actually like mm -hmm. less than a month ago, the, the other, this, the second brother. Um, but they built it in the sixties. Their dad was a magician. They were both from the TV industry and turned this, Victorian mansion into this incredible place of dinner and bars and theaters. And it's just awesome. It's fun. Yeah. Did you ever see or hang out with any, you know, famous magicians that we would know there at the magic castle? Where you're just like, you know, shooting the breeze with them. 
Uh, well, honestly, some of the best magicians I've ever seen are not as like TV famous, I sure. would say, as, you know, David Copperfield or whatever. But I did see um, uh, David Blaine got to, oh, really? you know, hang out with him for a little bit. Uh, other celebrities too, not even magicians, but other celebrities would go there since it is a members sure. only thing that you can kind of let loose. Um, but uh, Derek Delgado is an incredible magician who lives in New York now. He's got a, he's had a long running show there that was like highly acclaimed. He's in, incredible. Um, just not as like, you know, TV famous sure. as a, as Blaine or David Copperfield or whatever. Wasn't in there, uh, wasn't that Justin Willman or whatever, right? Did, didn't he go through there and he had oh, yeah, that, that Netflix Willman, show? Yeah, 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 that's cool. Yeah, he's another one that's there. In fact, he was just out here in my little town in Colorado recently doing really? his show. And I got to connect with him again and bring my daughter up on stage and meet him and everything. So that was fun too. That is he, cool. He's a nice guy as well. He's a great magician. Um, I feel like this is going to turn into like the many lives of Brian, but, uh, wasn't there a movie life of Brian, right? It's like then a Monty Python yeah. show. Um, cause now right. you're, now you're, uh, farmer, Brian, uh, you've got goats and stuff like that, right? Like you, you've moved to Colorado with goats. Yeah. So weird. I can't even, I got to pinch myself sometimes <laughs> because I grew up, like I said, in LA, I always thought, and you can ask any of my friends, like they're, I'm the last person they thought would leave LA. I grew up as a SoCal boy, sure. like <laughs> in LA Valley boy, actually in San Fernando Valley. Um, but as you get older, your priorities change. Right. True. And when I got married and had our daughter, we wanted to move, we were living in Pasadena at the time in LA. We wanted to move somewhere else that was a little bit slower pace that we had some space that, um, uh, LA is a tough place to raise a kid sometimes. And especially lately, it's gotten a little tough in LA and in San Francisco and, you know, California in general. So we had planned on moving. And then of course, when the pandemic hit, we packed up like a lot of people did and decided to move. And we loved Denver area, Colorado. We fell in love with it here. We had a couple friends that moved out here. So we got to come visit. We love the weather and the sunshine and nature. And it's kind of like how the suburbs of LA used to be when I was a kid. Sure. It reminds me a lot of that. Um, and we didn't plan on buying a ranch, but we did want some land. So we were looking at, you know, places that had maybe like two acres. I grew up the yeah, in suburbs my entire life. So, uh, the most land we had was like a quarter acre. Sure. So we're like, yes, let's get some breathing room. Let's get some space, especially <laughs> during COVID. We're like, oh man, I don't want to be around anybody. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so we were looking at places that had smaller lots, smaller than we have now, but, you know, still like two acres to five acres, something like that. And then couldn't really find anything. And then, then happened upon this place that this beautiful property that has incredible views of the mountains and mm. is surrounded by nature and happened to be a, a new house. This family will also moved because of COVID. So they had just built this house, but decided to move close to family in Florida. So they sold it and had a barn. I'm in the barn office. Now there's an office built out already in the barn. So there's like it. all these things that work for us. Um, yeah, so we got, we haven't, we don't have horses yet, but we got goats and chickens and barn cats and our dogs that came with us and our neighbors have longhorn cattle, Texas longhorns and Highland shepherd cattle right here. We get roosters behind us and the donkeys <laughs> we can hear. And so it's fun. It's just being kind of living the dream here in our, our ranch environment, but we're still super close to the downtown of the of the town we live in five minutes, 10 wow. minutes from there. So all the amenities are yeah. what we need. And then 20 miles from Denver. So we're, we're, you know, 30 minutes maybe from Denver. So if we want to go into the city to catch a game or to go eat a nice meal or whatever, we're, it's right there too. That's awesome. So, yeah. It's kind of just worked out. We got lucky. Um, this is one of the only times I probably ever get an opportunity to do this then on my podcast. So I'm going to show off some of my animal sounds um, unless you have oh, any yeah. good ones too. So I've got the horse here. Coat? I don't know. Well, I, maybe, maybe, I don't know if I have a goat, but I've got a good horse and a good pig and a good elephant. So even though you probably don't it. have any elephants, so here's my horse. Nay. <laughs> Daughter loves that one, right? You got to add the <laughs> to it. And then the pig, there's a, <laughs> I don't even know if oh, that shows up one. there. And then uh, the elephant. That's a good one. Yeah, I can hear it. <laughs> Pretty good elephant, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, those are good. All right. I like it. And you got the lobster shirt going, so <laughs> there you go. You're an animal guy. There you go. Um, one of the other things that I wanted to talk to you about was just um, you were telling me about uh, a, a moment that you met Pete Carroll, 
Um, we were asked, I was talking to you just about like, what was it like, you know, meeting like one of your celebrities or whatever, and you, you brought up Pete Carroll. So tell me about this, this encounter that you had with him. Oh man. All right. So <clears throat> excuse me, for those of you who don't know who Pete Carroll is, he's a, uh, uh, now a professional football coach. He coaches the Seattle Seahawks. Um, and so I grew up in LA. I went to USC. I'm a huge diehard USC football fan. Um, and so, you know, I'd been love USC football. Now, if you remember back in the mid 2000s, we had a pretty good team. We had Matt Leiner and Pete and uh, Reggie Bush and others playing and we won national championships. And Pete Carroll was the coach of USC at the time. So, and we went from being a really crappy team to national championships in like one season, basically. Yeah, so, right. um, the, you know, the question that a lot of people had is how did, how did that happen? Like what's Pete Carroll's secret sauce? And by the way, Pete Carroll came from the NFL to USC and he wasn't successful at the, in, in the NFL. He had been mm. fired, I think by the Jets or Patriots right before he came to USC. And he took some time off to kind of figure out what his philosophy was in life and, and how he operates. And then, and then USC ended up being like a Petri dish experiment for him that was ended up working. Yeah. So Anyway, I'll, I'll try to shorten the story a little bit, but um, I had read an article in the USC Business School magazine um, about Pete Carroll, where they interviewed him and, and tried to get to what his secret of success was. And he talked a lot about manifesting positive outcomes and always believing something positive was going to happen, happen and um, playing without fear and mm. training like it's a championship. And he actually has his master's, I believe, in sports psychology. So this is like right up his alley, right? Sure. And this is also right around the time of, if you remember The Secret? Oh, the yeah. The movie that came out, the yeah. book that was like about manifesting, putting things out into the universe and kind of manifesting that. So it's kind of like thinking about that and read that and was, you know, kind of in, in doing like vision boards and having things manifest. So this was kind of all aligned, right? When I read this article, I'm like, oh, okay. So it's kind of the same kind of thing there. And so I wrote, I wanted to meet him and I wanted to see this in action. And not only because I have this love for USC, but like, I want to see it. So I wrote, not an email, not typed. I wrote a letter, and mailed it to him <laughs> saying, I, I explaining everything I just explained and saying, I would love to like shadow him for a day just to see how he works with his team and the coaches and everything. And I didn't hear anything for a while. And then finally got a letter back saying, would love to have you come out to a practice and let's meet and we can chat about it and blah, blah, blah. Nice. So I got to go out to a practice. I scheduled time, met with him, went up to his office afterwards. He gave me some books to read kind of along those same lines and uh, the inner game of tennis and, and some other books. Um, really interesting. Just had a really awesome, interesting meeting. And so that led to me actually in him inviting me back to shadow him for the full day. And for those of you know, Pete Carroll is now still at 70 plus years old, has probably more energy than most 30 year olds. Right. <laughs> and he did back then too, in his fifties. And like, I was, it was hard to keep up with him, man. This dude was <laughs> jogging everywhere and running everywhere and like 6 AM to 10 PM every day. Wow. And, uh, you know, so he starts by meeting with the coaches and watching tape from the day before and, um, and it was just fun. I got to like live this dream of being on the inside behind the curtain of USC football and like get to meet these players that have been watching on the field and these coaches and sit and call recruits and have them be all excited about being invited for a scholarship to USC and, and going to practice and eat lunch with everybody. And yeah. like, it was just so fun. And I just learned so much from him and, um, still I use this, a lot of what I learned to this day, um, and then he invited me back again because that was in the spring. So he's like, you sure. got to come back in the fall right before the season. And it's like right. even more exciting. And so I did it again. Uh, and that led to me helping volunteering with his charity that he had in L.A. And it also led to me becoming a Seahawks fan when he left USC and went sure. to the Seahawks. So um, I don't know. It was just such a cool thing for me, like just to see and learn and be in an environment that I was already in love with. And uh mm -hmm. And to, and to learn from somebody who was doing it um, and applying that. And, you know, going back to the beginning, like the empathy thing, that was a big part of his thing too and working with the coaches. and But just keeping that positive because you lose games. You, yeah. you know, things happen when you're startup and keeping that positive, 
optimistic mindset that something good is about to happen and yeah. keep pushing forward and keep, yeah, just, you know, slow and steady. Stay positive, stay grounded, right? Like get outside a little bit. Um, and, uh, yeah, I like that. Be empathetic and work hard. I mean, 6 AM to 10 PM, that's not easy, right? It's like put in the hours, put in the time, work hard. Like it's not going to just fall into your lap, but, uh, stay positive throughout it. That's, um, it's always nice when you can meet your, your, uh, your idols and they, they live up to what, you know, your expectations. You're like, that was a good experience yeah. versus uh, being, and they're idol. generous with their time. Right. Yeah. He was, I mean, he had, he was running a championship football team. He didn't right. have to even write me back, but right. he was generous with his time. And, um, it says a lot about him. I think that's cool. Brian, um, it's been absolutely amazing talking to you today. I want to make sure that I'm respectful of your time and everybody's time listening here. If people wanted to work with you, uh, if they wanted to uh, follow you, you know, stay in touch with you, what's the best way for them to, to follow and get in touch? Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm uh, on social media. <laughs> LinkedIn is probably the easiest way. Um, my handle or whatever we call it is Brian C. Nolan. B-R-I-A-N-C is in Christopher, Nolan, N-O-L-A-N. Uh, so that's on Instagram, uh, LinkedIn, whatever. They're, they're all the same, Twitter. Okay. Um, so you can DM me on Twitter. You can DM me on LinkedIn. Um, those are probably the easiest ways to get in touch. And I'm always posting stuff there too of what, what's going on and what's next. So that's, yeah. And thanks for having me. This has been fun. Yeah, Reminiscing. Absolutely. All the old memories. All kinds of good stuff. I, you know, I hope everybody took away something of you know, value here. There's, there's a lot of value, but there's also a lot of just being able to recognize. I think that, uh, you know, this transcends a lot of different genres. This transcends everything from, from startup world and B2B into startup world and B2C into working at GoDaddy. And then you've even got, you know, goats and magic and EMT and, you know, college football, like all of these things, they all hinge on a lot of the same core concepts, which is staying positive, work hard, you know, be empathetic. I think those are things that everybody should be able to, to focus on. So thanks everybody for jumping yeah. in and listening. Have a great day. Thanks William. Thanks for listening to the up arrow podcast with William Harris. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.